then so this one sheet titled monotonicity gathers momentum Right, so, uh, you know, I have marked the problems that you should be attempting. I hope you, you've gone by that order, right? So, 5 part 1, let's look at 5 part 1, problem number 5 part 1. <coughs> so, we have a fifth degree polynomial fx, which is like, x power 5 minus 3x minus 1. This is a fifth degree polynomial. And we want to establish, we want to establish that this polynomial has a unique root in 1 to 2. We want to establish that this polynomial has a unique root in the interval 1 to 2. Now, first of all, <coughs> If it changes sign in the interval, <coughs> then one root is guaranteed, right? If it changes sign in the interval, one root is guaranteed. It is a continuous function, right? Polynomials are continuous everywhere. So, in the interval 1 to 2, it is continuous. Now, <coughs> f1 is minus 3, right? Which is negative. right f2 <coughs> how much 25 is positive so for sure it changes sign in the interval 1 to 2 so one root is guaranteed but if a continuous function changes sign in an interval i've told you in the past it could have one root or three roots or five roots in general an odd number of real roots in that interval right so one root in the interval 1 to 2 is guaranteed owing to the property of continuous functions, right? Now, it is like at x equal to 1, this function has a negative value minus 3. At x equal to 2, it has a positive value 25, right? It has to go from this point to this point, right? If it is monotonic in this interval, then it will have only one root. That means if it does not have a stationary point in this interval, it will be monotonic in this interval, right? Then it will have only one root. So, if I can show that f dash x is positive in the interval 1 to 2, then the problem is taken care of. If f dash x is positive, f x would be monotonically increasing and it will cross the x axis. This is the x axis exactly at one point, right? So, all that you need to then examine for the sake of the problem is f dash x. f dash x is 5 x power 4 minus 3. That is f dash x. Very clearly, when x is greater than 1, this will be greater than 5, this will be greater than 0, yes or no? So, when x lies in the interval 1 to 2, f dash x is positive. Therefore, f x must be increasing for x greater than 1 for x greater than 1 fx must be increasing and therefore the graph of the function goes from this point 1 comma minus 3 to 2 comma 25 monotonically increasing and it would cross the x axis exactly at one point establishing thereby that it has exactly one root in the interval 1 to 2 how about it right no issues okay Let's get into the next problem. Then, five part two. <coughs> five part two, we are talking of a function fx, which is like x cubed plus two x squared plus x plus 5. We are talking of this function, a cubic polynomial x cubed plus 
2 x squared plus x plus 5. First of all, we want to show that this has exactly one real root. 1, it has exactly one real root alpha and that the box of alpha, it is such that box of alpha is minus 3. That is what we want to establish. Hey, that means if I can show that this alpha lies in the interval minus 3 to minus 2, then box of alpha would be minus 3. That's an equivalent problem to address. Right? Now, <coughs> look at f dash text. Look at f dash text. That's like a 3x squared plus 4x plus 1, right? <coughs> Which is like 3x plus 1 into x plus 1, right? Hmm? So there are two stationary points, minus 1 and minus one third. It's a cubic polynomial coming from down below. The first one will be a local maximum, then there will be a local minimum, and the function will then go on heavenwards, right? I've discussed cubics. Yes. Okay. Now, <coughs> say this was the x-axis at x equal to minus 1, there is going to be a local maximum. At x equal to minus 1 third, there is going to be a local minimum. <coughs> right? Now, have you found the values of the function at mon minus 1 and minus 1 third? What is f minus 1? Have you found that out? Hmm? f minus 1 turns out to be positive and f minus 1 third you can check for yourself is also positive. Put x equal to minus 1 and minus 1 third, it will turn out to be positive. That means, now these are two stationary points of the function. These are two stationary points of the function and the value of the function at these two stationary points is positive. Which means, the graph comes from down below. It picks up like this, a local maximum, a local minimum and then it goes this way. At x equal to minus 1, a local maximum. At x equal to minus 1 third, a local minimum. And it goes this way. This is the graph of the function, isn't it? It goes from minus infinity to plus infinity with two stationary points. At these stationary points, the function has a positive value, which you can verify, right? And therefore, can you see that there is it crosses the x-axis exactly at 1 point alpha? So, one root alpha is certain and that's the only real root, that's the only real root. The other two roots of this cubic would be complex, right? Now, the next part of the problem is you want to show that box of alpha is minus 3. That means if alpha lies in the interval minus 2 to minus 3, right? Now, please check. Please check, this is f minus 2. If f minus 2 is positive and if f minus 3 is negative, then alpha will lie in the interval minus 2 to minus 3. You may verify that. You will check, you'll be able to see that f minus 3 is less than 0. Have you, right? How much? Minus 7, okay. f minus 2 is how much? 3. So f minus 3, as they say, is minus 7 and f minus 2 is? 3. So, if that happens, if that happens, then the function changes sign in the interval minus 3 to minus 2. It must have a root in that interval and that root is unique anyways. That has been established. Therefore, alpha, the only real root of this cubic lies in the interval minus 3 to minus 2 and therefore, box of alpha must be minus 3. Box of alpha therefore must be minus 3. <coughs> Yeah, you could have drawn the wavy curve and but the point is it's the same thing <laughs> one root is already established there is uniqueness of root so i don't have to look at monotonicity anymore why did i look at monotonicity because 
I wanted to establish uniqueness of fruit. Now the uniqueness has already been established. So I don't have to work around monotonicity anymore. I just need to show that there is change of sign in the interval so that there is a root in that interval. Now uniqueness of that root is no longer a concern. That has been established. Uniqueness of alpha has been established given the graph of the function. So why do I bother about monotonicity anymore? I will only bother about the placement of the root minus 3 to minus 2 which will happen if it changes sign in the interval minus 3 to minus you could have done that you could have you could have established monotonicity but but that would have only shown if we didn't draw the graph that would have only established that one root in the interval minus 3 to minus 2 it wouldn't have established that there aren't roots other after minus 2 that would have been a catch there so it wouldn't suffice right shall we proceed then hmm? we want to examine we want to examine the monotonicity of y equal to fx which is mod of x minus 1 by x squared which is mod of x minus 1 by x squared we want to be able to establish uh, we want to be able to figure out the intervals of monotonicity. What I am going to do is, let me get very general with this, uh, this problem. Let me go ahead and draw the graph of this function. What do you say? Let me just go ahead and draw the graph of y equal to fx equal to mod of x minus 1 by x squared. So that will do two things. Of course, the problem at hand would get solved. The second thing, you will get some more exposure to tracing graphs, right? So one thing for sure, few things that you can readily interpret out of this expression mod x minus 1 by x squared. Mm -hmm. Y will never be negative for any given x because the numerator is a modulus, can never be negative, the denominator can never be negative. So for sure it will never be negative. So the graph of this will never fall below the x axis, that is guaranteed, right. So one graph strictly not strictly graph not below the x axis that is certain right 2 it has only one root x equal to 1 right only one root x equal to 1 y will become 0 only at x equal to right now <coughs> let me break this function into two simpler functions right y is going to be <coughs> fx which is 1 minus x by x squared for x less than or equal to 1 and is going to be x minus 1 by x squared for x greater than 1 there is change of behavior at x equal to 1 for a modulus function but there is no discontinuity that results left hand limit at 1 is the same as right hand limit at 1 equal to 0 so despite change of behavior a modulus function does not participate in an ugly manner to produce discontinuity right so no discontinuity at x equal to 1 that's for sure let me differentiate this function let me differentiate this function x equal to 1 a modulus function a mod x minus a even though at x equal to a does not produce discontinuity it produces loss of differentiability so you would expect that the function is not differentiable at x equal to 1 despite being continuous at x equal to 1 that means you would expect the left hand derivative at x equal to 1 to be different from the right hand derivative at x equal to 1 you it is easy to predict but let's verify that okay now, f dash x is minus 2 by x cube plus 1 by x squared, yes or no? Hmm? Which is like x minus 2 by x cube 
for x greater than or for x less than or equal to 1 right if i differentiate this for x less than or equal to 1 if i differentiate this i get minus 2 by x cube plus 1 by x squared which is like x minus 2 by x cube for x less than or equal to 1 right similarly it's going to be 2 minus x by x cube differentiate this then this will be negative of the derivative of this 2 minus x by x cube for x greater than 1 yes or no right very clearly the left hand derivative at 1 is negative minus 1 by 1 right and the right hand derivative at 1 is positive 1 by 1 that means the left hand derivative is minus 1 at 1 put x equal to 1 you get minus 1 that means the left hand tangent makes an obtuse angle with the positive direction of the x axis 135 degrees actually it makes 130 because f dash x is minus 1 that means the left hand tangent makes 135 degrees with the positive direction of the x axis f dash 1 right hand derivative is going to be 1 so 45 degrees so the right hand tangent makes an acute angle with the positive direction of the x axis very clearly the function is not differentiable at x equal to 1 you would expect sharpness at x equal to 1 but continuity is not an issue at x equal to 1 right at x equal to 1 the function is also not uh, at, at x equal to 1 the function also has a root right the function becomes 0 at x equal to 1 now <coughs> so let let me draw the graph in bits and pieces around x equal to 1 I know what is happening at x equal to 1 y is 0 right now also realize when x is less than 1 this becomes a negative number when x is less than 1 and greater than 0 when x is less than 1 and greater than 0 greater than 0 see when x is less than 1 and greater than 0 this will become a negative number yes or no and if it becomes a negative number that means f dash x is negative if f dash x is negative for x lying in the interval 0 to 1 fx must be a decreasing function of x in the interval 0 to 1 f must be decreasing monotonically decreasing in this interval in this interval f must be monotonically decreasing yes or no similarly <coughs> So, for sure, x greater than 0, less than 1, f dash x is less than 0. So, f must be monotonically decreasing. Yes or no? What? Hmm? Now, for x greater than 1, I will have to look at this description. For x greater than 1, do you realize that f dash x is positive? Right? For x greater than 1, but less than 2. For x greater than 1, but less than 2 f dash x is positive less than 2 f dash x is positive therefore f must be increasing yes or no at x equal to 2 f dash becomes 0 right at x equal to 2 at x equal to 2 f dash 2 is 0 you would expect a stationary point at x equal to 2 for x greater than 2 for x greater than 2 this will become negative because denominator is positive numerator is negative that means for x greater than 2 f dash x is negative for x greater than 0 greater than 2 beg your pardon greater than 2 f dash x is negative therefore f must be decreasing ever after f must be a decreasing function ever after therefore to the left of 2 f dash is positive to the right of 2 f dash is negative at x equal to 2 f dash is 0 x equal to 2 must be therefore a local maximum f at x equal to 2 there must be a local maximum of the function right now in the interval 0 to 1 the function decreases at x equal to 1 it is 0 and between 0 and 1 the function is decreasing monotonically right and then from 1 to 2 
F dashed is positive. So F is increasing. For x greater than 2, f dashed again is negative. So function decreasing. Yes or no? Clear? Now. For x less than 0. Yes. For x less than 0, you realize that denominator will be negative. Numer this will be for x less than 0, right? Not this description. x less than or equal to 1. Right, so x less than 0 would be a sub interval of this. So x less than 0, numerator negative, denominator negative, ratio positive. Right, so for x less than 0, f dashed is negative, so f must be positive. Beg your pardon, f must be positive, numerator and denominator both negative, so f must be increasing. Yes or no? Right. So, for x less than 0, you would encounter an increasing function, something like this, yes or no? Now, please check. So, so far so good, right? Sketchily drawn the graph of the function. Hmm? Can I remove some data from here? One thing for sure, limit fx, x tends to 0 will be plus infinity. Do you see that? Limit fx as x tends to 0, this tends to minus 1, this comes closer and closer to 0, this becomes larger and larger and is positive, it tends to plus infinity. Whether x tends to 0 from the less than 0 side or greater than 0 side, y will tend to plus infinity, right? So, 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 this is what is happening. Right? As x tends to 0, y tends to infinity. That's guaranteed. Now, similarly, limit fx, x tends to minus infinity, say. Minus infinity means less than 1. I'll take this description. is going to be, is going to be like limit 1 minus x by x squared x tends to minus infinity, limit fx, x tends to minus infinity, what, what will this be? 0. Why? Divide by x or you can even apply Lapidus rule, so minus 1 by 2x, you can apply Lapidus rule, so minus 1 by, because it's of the form infinity by infinity, so minus 1 by 2x, as x tends to minus infinity, it's going to be 0, which is what you see here, as x tends to minus infinity, fx is tending to 0. Right? Similarly, limit fx, x tends to plus infinity, x tends to plus infinity, you will take this as the description, x minus 1. So, if instead of 1 minus x, you had x minus 1, as x tends to plus infinity, that will also be 0. So, then, which means to the right of 2, as x tends to plus infinity, fx is tending to 0. This is the trace, trace of this function. Now you know from minus infinity to 0, it is increasing. From 0 to 1, it is decreasing. 1 to 2, it is increasing. 2 to infinity, it is decreasing. It has one local minimum. This is a local minimum, even though the function is not differentiable at this point, x equal to 1 is still a local minimum, right? x equal to 2 is a local maximum of the function, yes or no? Right? Got me? Hmm? However, however, even though in this case, the local minimum is the smallest value of the function, local maximum is not the greatest value of the function. Do you realize? Yes, because it could be made larger than f2, as large as you want. Yes or no? So, this is the local maximum, but not the great global maximum or the greatest value of the function. Clear? You understand everything that I have communicated? Clear?
Let's move to the next problem. Like what? Like this? If it decreases like this, it'll. you mean like this? Okay. See, if it decreases that way, this way, hmm? check for the second derivative. The shape, whether it's concave or convex, F double dashed x, you'll find that in this case, F double dashed will turn out to be positive. For x greater than 0, you'll find F double dashed x to be positive. And which means then the shape has to be concave, right? Hmm? And moreover, no, there is also there is other. I actually wouldn't even go ahead and do this. You know why? Because I know for sure that the curve comes this way from infinity, so it has to touch like this. Now, if it was like this, then it would cut the y-axis actually. But it is not cutting the y-axis. So if it was like this, it would cut the y-axis. It would cut the y-axis. That is what would happen. So which is not happening, right? So even without differentiating a second time, I can conclude that this must be the shape, right? Shall we move to the next problem then? All right, seven Bombay then. <coughs> No. You'll see what. Uh, 1 plus cortex we want to show is less than or equal to cot x by 2 for x belonging to 0 to pi. For x belonging to 0 to pi, we want to show that 1 plus cot x is less than or equal to cot x pi 2. Okay. Now, I will construct an auxiliary function which is difference between the two sides of the inequality, right? Examine monotonicity, etc., right? <coughs> so, let me construct a function fx which say is cot x by 2 minus 1 plus cot x, right? Clear? Then f dash x would be, this would be minus half cos x squared x by 2, cos x squared x by 2 means 2 sin squared x by 2, right, plus cos x squared x, cos x squared x is like 1 by sin squared x, hmm? <coughs> which is to say this is like minus 1 by 2 sin squared x by 2 plus 1 by 4 sin squared x by 2 cos squared x by 2? Yes or no? Hello? <coughs> See, sin x is 2 sin x by 2 cos x by 2. So, then this, which is like now, I take the LCM. So, 4 sin squared x by 2 cos squared x by 2 is like minus 2 cos squared x by 2 plus 1 which is minus cos x this is minus cos x right so f dash x is like minus cos x divided by this is sin squared x. This is actually sin squared x once again. Okay. Now, realize, can I remove the clutter from here so that I have more space to write? Hmm? Wipe this portion off. I will just retain this.
See, f dash x is minus cos x by sin squared x, right? Now, do you realize that this will become 0 at x equal to pi by 2? Isn't it? It will become 0 at x equal to pi by 2, yes or no? So, f dashed pi by 2 is 0. Right? Now, when x is slightly less than pi by 2, f dashed x is positive, negative. When x is less than pi by 2, when x is slightly less than pi by 2, f dashed x will be negative because cos x and sin squared x both will be positive. So, when x is slightly less than pi by 2, f dashed x will be negative. Right? When x is slightly greater than pi by 2, cos x will be negative because it goes into the second quadrant. Cos x would be negative, so f dash x would be positive. So, f dash x then would be positive. Clear? Which means, to the left of pi by 2, f dash x is negative. To the right of pi by 2, f dash x is positive. At x equal to pi by 2, f dash x is 0. That means, it must be a local minimum. x equal to pi by 2 must be a local minimum. Okay. And this being the only stationary point, it is not just the local minimum, it is the least value of the function. Yes or no? f pi by 2 is the least value of the function. It is not just a local minimum. x equal to pi by 2 is also the global minimum because it is the only stationary point in this interval. x equal to pi by 2 is a local minimum for sure and is also the least value or the global minimum of the function, right? So, if it is the least value, then for any other x in the interval 0 to pi, for any other x in the interval 0 to pi, fx must be greater than or equal to f pi by 2. fx must be greater than or equal to f of pi by 2 because f pi by 2 is the least. So, any other f, fx will not be smaller than f pi by 2. Right? But what is f pi by 2? 1 cot pi by 4 minus 1 0 plus cot pi by 2 which is 0. So, f pi by 2 is 0. Can you see that? f pi by 0. So, f x must be greater than or equal to 0. <laughs> this is greater than or equal to 0 which is what we set out to prove. Yes or no? Where is f dash x less than 0? It is less than 0 in the interval 0 to pi by 2, but from pi by 2 to pi, it is greater than 0. No, to the left of pi by 2, it was decreasing. To the right of pi by 2, it was increasing. Yes or no? Therefore, at pi by 2, it bottomed out. At pi by 2, it bottomed out. And therefore, f x must have been greater than or equal to its bottom f pi by 2. Isn't it? Got me? In it, we want to establish, we want to establish ln 1 plus 1 by x greater than 1 by 1 plus x for x greater than 0. First thing, we want to do this. Right? The second thing that we want to establish is that for x greater than 0, given this, given this, having established this, we want to show that fx, which is 1 plus 1 by x to the power x must be an increasing function of x in the interval x equal to 0 to infinity. If we can establish this, using that, we need to show that 1 plus 1 by x to the power x must be an increasing function of x. Right? Hmm? <clears throat> so, 
let me deal with this first let me create an auxiliary function which is this minus this clear right as we have done customarily we would differentiate with respect to x this function right let me remove this for the time being it's occupying space phi dash x is <coughs> 1 by 1 plus 1 by x into minus 1 by x squared plus 1 by 1 plus x whole squared. Yes or no? Right? That's phi dash x, which will reduce to minus 1 by x into x plus 1 plus 1 by x plus 1 whole square right so x into x plus 1 whole squared lcm so this would be like minus of x plus 1 plus x right hmm? which then is as good as phi dash x is minus 1 by x into x plus 1 whole squared. Clear? Yes or no? For x greater than 0, it's clearly negative. Yes or no? For x greater than 0, it's clearly negative. That means for x greater than 0, phi x must be a monotonically decreasing function of x. Phi x must therefore be a monotonically Decreasing function of x. Now, can I remove all of this from you? Hmm? This portion? <coughs> this would lead us to phi x being monotonically decreasing. Phi x being monotonically decreasing for x greater than 0. Yes or no? Now, for x greater than 0, if phi x is decreasing, this is some x. This is phi x. Right? So, do you realize phi x is decreasing? So, phi x will be less than limit phi x as x tends to infinity. Yes or no? Phi x will be less, will be sorry, phi x will be greater than phi infinity. Phi x will be greater than phi infinity for x less than infinity and greater than 0. Yes or no? Yes or no? As you go further and further away, you are approaching x equal to infinity and then phi infinity will be smaller than phi x. Yes or no? So, can I not say that phi x will be greater than limit phi x as x tends to infinity? Can I say this? Phi x will be greater than limit phi x as x tends to infinity? How about it? Right? Hey, but what's limit phi x as x tends to infinity? This will tend to 0. So, this will tend to 0. This will tend to 0. So, limit phi x as x tends to infinity is 0. Clear? So, phi x will be greater than 0. Because you always did phi x greater than phi 0. <laughs> right? You were stuck with that thought. Therefore, you know you were... You, it, you are not ready to take phi infinity except you know you because you've always said phi x greater than phi 0 if it's decreasing phi x less than phi 0 etc so you didn't want to compare it with anything except x equal to 0 that was a mental frame in which you were so this is just a departure from that mental frame that's why you were stuck even in the last problem you know you were you were hoping that f dash x would be unequal unequivocally either positive or negative in the interval 0 to pi which didn't happen right Right, so yeah, so so th these two problems are suggestive of the fact that you know don't get stuck to a 
preconceived mental frame. Stay a little more loose, free, flexible. That will help. Clear? Okay, so phi x greater than 0. So phi x greater than 0 means this will be greater than this and this fact gets duly worked out. <coughs> now, the next part of the problem is we want to show, <coughs> given this, we want to show that 1 plus 1 by x to power x strictly increases. Right? Can I wipe this off? Now the next part is very, very simple. For x greater than 0, we want to show that fx is an increasing function of x. That means we want to show that f dashed x must be positive. f dashed x must be positive. So, this of course I can write as e power x ln 1 plus 1 by x. Tell me if you find this acceptable. This a could be written as e power ln a, e power ln a into x, right? Yes or no? Hmm? So, let me differentiate f with respect to x, f dash x. Chain rule, e power x ln 1 plus 1 by x. Yes or no? Right? And this of course is the same as 1 plus x to power 1. Restoring this to its original uh, looks. 1 plus 1 by x to power x. These are the original looks of this. Choose this. And this becomes ln 1 plus 1 by x <coughs> minus 1 by 1 plus x. And we have already established that this is greater than this for x greater than 0. So, this is positive, this is positive. So, f dash x is positive. So, f x must be an increasing function of x. f x therefore must be an increasing function of x. In fact, as x tends to infinity, this will tend to e. As f tends to as x tends to infinity, this will tend to e. Why? See, you can check that this divided by 1 by x. As x tends to infinity, ln 1 plus something by something as something tends to 0, that is 1. So, this will tend to e. Yeah, that is a standard result also. That is a standard. Yeah, yeah. All's good. want to show for x greater than 0, we want to establish ln x less than x, ln x less than x and then we want to show that for theta lying in the interval e power minus pi by 2 to pi by 2. ln cos theta less than cos ln theta. First, we want to establish this and then using that result, we want to establish that if a theta is an angle lying in the interval e power minus pi by 2 to pi by 2, then ln cos theta will be less than cos of ln theta. Clear? Right? <coughs> so, as is usual, we take fx equal to say x minus ln x right? f dash x is 1 minus 1 by x 
right and now x equal to 1 is a stationary point right f dashed 1 is 0 as you can see x equal to 1 therefore constitutes a stationary point we need to check if it's a local maximum or a local minimum now when x is slightly less than 1 when x is slightly less than 1 1 by x will be greater than 1 f dash x will be negative yes or no when x is slightly less than 1 1 by x will be great greater than 1 so this will be less than 0 f dash will be less than 0 yes or no when x is greater than 1 1 by x will be less than 1 this will be greater than 0 f dash will be greater than 0 yes or no for x greater than 1 that means to the left of 1 f dash is, is less than 0 to the right of 1 f dash is positive at x equal to 1 f dash is 0 therefore x equal to 1 must be a local minimum of the function x equal to 1 therefore must be a local minimum of the function hey this is the only stationary point so it's not just a local minimum it's the global minimum it's the least value of the function yes or no x equal to 1 is not just a local minimum being the only stationary point it's also the least value or the global minimum of the function at x equal to 1 you encounter not only a local minimum but also the least value of the function that means f1 must be the least f1 must be the least yes or no least that means for any x greater than 0 f1 is the least for all the fx's that means fx must be greater than or equal to f1 must be greater than or equal to f1 hey but what is f1 1 1 f1 is 1 because ln1 is 0 this is 1 f1 is 1 yes or no which is clearly greater than 0 <laughs> yes or no f1 is 1 which is clearly greater than 0 so fx is greater than 0 yes or no right hmm? very clearly <laughs> yes if it's greater than x it will be greater than 1 plus x also it will be greater than 2 plus x also <laughs> So, fx greater than 0, yes or no? So, x greater than ln x, right? So, ln x less than x, which is what we set out to prove. Clear? So, again, the function was not monotonic from 0 to infinity. See, it encountered a stationary point, right? It would happen that this stationary point could be a local maximum and local minimum. Compare fx with that local maximum or local minimum, right? Okay. Now the next part of the problem. Can I remove all of this? We will use this fact now. Right? <coughs> so, if you are taking the other way around, x minus ln x, we would have uh, f of 1 is greater than f of x. So, that would result in 1 greater than f of x. So then it would give me a local maximum. No, but if it's 1 greater than f of x, how can you say that 0 is greater than Where, f of x? How do you get 1 greater than f x? What do you got just the opposite of that if you take the function? So then you will get x minus ln x minus x instead of x minus ln x. Hey, you are only wasting my time. It's going to be the same thing with uh, terms swapped. Come on, yaar. Uh, Please check that out. That's you are you are just missing out on fundamental algebra. I'm not going to spend time on that. So if theta lies in the interval e to power minus pi by two to pi by two, we want to show that this is what happens, right? <coughs> now, if theta lies in the interval e, na, e power minus pi by two to pi by two, realize <coughs> log x is an increasing function of x, right? So if I take the log of all the entities here the direction of the inequality will not change because log is increasing so the direction of the inequality will remain preserved so let me take log of the whole thing do you realize that log theta 
would be greater than minus pi by 2 and will be less than log pi by 2 yes or no clear hey but log pi by 2 will be less than pi by 2 yes or no given this inequality log pi by 2 will be less than pi by 2 how about it right log pi by 2 will be less than pi by 2 so which means log theta would be a number lying in the interval minus pi by 2 to plus pi by 2 that means this is a certain angle alpha in the fourth and the first quadrant yes or no from the fourth to the first quadrant minus pi by 2 to plus pi by 2 so if i take cos of this it will always be positive since this lies in the interval minus pi by 2 to pi by 2 cos of this will always be positive cos is positive in the fourth and the first quadrant so which means cos of ln theta will always be positive cos of ln theta will always be positive clear so this is always a positive number right now in this interval theta also lies from 0 to pi by 2 theta is in the first quadrant only theta is only in the first quadrant so if theta is in the first quadrant cos theta will always lie between 0 and 1 isn't it cos theta will always lie in the interval 0 to 1 because theta belongs to the first quadrant only now if cos theta lies between 0 and 1 log of cos theta will be negative log of a number lying between 0 and 1 will always be negative so if this is a number lying in the interval 0 to 1 log of this number will always be negative so which means log of cos theta will always be negative this is always positive this is always negative so which is bigger this is bigger so cos ln theta will always be bigger than ln cos theta yes or no cos ln theta positive will always be bigger than any negative number ln cos theta so this is greater than this finish right 14 now we have a sequence of numbers a n given by n by n square plus 10 n is a natural number we have a sequence of numbers given by a n equal to n by n squared plus 10 i can keep assigning various natural number values to n and i can keep getting various values of a n right i now want to be able to find the greatest possible value of a n and find the natural number n for which it's going to be the greatest right this of course is defined only for discrete numbers n equal to 1 2 3 etc not for all n but what i do is i create an extension of this i create a continuous function out of this let me create a function fx which is an extension of an an will be a subset of this fx which is like x by x square plus 10 the only difference is the domain of this is n is a natural number only the domain of this is all real x that's the only difference so a n will only be a subset of fx x can assume all real values in this case n will assume only natural number values right now what i do is i find the great value of fx i find out the greatest value of fx now they, that may not occur for x to be a natural number but does not matter that will help me investigate the function right so f dash x is <clears throat> x square plus 10 minus 2x squared <coughs> divided by x square plus 10 whole square yes or no hmm? which is minus of x square minus 10 whole square right which is like minus x plus 1 by root 10 x minus 1 by root 10 divided by x square plus 10 whole square 
right yes or no root 10 sorry 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 i'm so i'm so sorry i'm so sorry <laughs> this just a lapse here i'll fix this root 10 <laughs> right now the denominator let me let me look at the sign of f dash x in various intervals let me look at the sign of f dash x in various intervals I can draw the wavy curve for x plus root 10 and x. The sign of f dash x will be the same as the, of the numerator. Now, if I look at the wavy curve for x plus root 10 into x minus root 10, just the numerator because this is what determines the sign, right? Right? Then this is minus root 10 plus root 10 for just this, for this, right? Minus root 10. And plus root 10, that's a wavy curve for this, sign of this in various intervals. The wavy curve for negative of this, which is the numerator, the wavy curve for that is going to be, this is the wavy curve for minus of x plus root 10 into x minus root 10. Yes or no? This is the wavy curve for the numerator of the given function. For, for the derivative of that function, right? I hope all of you understand this, right? Now, so f dash x will become 0 at minus root 10. This is the scheme of f dash x, sign of f dash x in various intervals because the sign of f dash x will be determined by the sign of this. So, if this is the sign scheme for this, this will also be the sign scheme for f dash x, right? Now, do you see that f dash x is becoming 0 at x equal to root 10? f dash x is becoming 0 at minus root 10. To the left of root 10, f dash x is positive. To the immediate right of root 10, f dash x is negative. Yes or no? That means x equal to root 10 must be a local maximum. Right? Similarly, x equal to minus root 10 must be a local maximum minimum right but i'm not bothering about minus root 10 because i want to look at this for x greater than 0 at least because i get confined to n being a natural number so let me look at this fx for only x greater than 0 so for x greater than 0 the function has just one local maximum x equal to root 10 for x greater than 0 x equal to root 10 will be a local maximum and this being the only stationary point will also be the greatest value of the function, right? That means f root 10 will be the greatest value of the function, also the global maximum. Yes or no? The function attains a maximum value at x equal to root 10. Now, realize, can I remove some of those things from there? See, do you also see that f0 is 0? f0 is 0? If I include 0, say, right? And limit fx, x tends to infinity is limit 1 by x plus 10, 10 by x as x tends to infinity, right? As x tends to infinity, this will tend to 0, this will tend to infinity, so this will tend to infinity, this will tend to 0. Yes or no? So, at x equal to 0, the function is 0. When x becomes larger and larger, then also the function tends to 0, right? And at x equal to root 10, the function has a local maximum. So, you will see a bell-shaped curve at x equal to 0, 0. At x equal to root 10, a local maximum. And then it dips to 0, right? So, the graph of this function, the graph of this function is going to be at x equal to 0, 0 and then it increases at root 10 it assumes a maximum value and then as x tends to infinity it tends to 0 right yes or no now 
When x is 1, 2, 3, 4, it will give me a1, a2, a3. The y's will be at x equal to 1, 2, 3, 4. The y's will be a1, a2, a3. Yes or no? So all these ans appear as ordinates for n equal to 1, n equal to 2, n equal to 3, n equal to 4. Right? Now, root 10 is a number lying between 3 and 4. Right? 3. So this will be a3. Yes or no? This will be a3. F3 will be A3. F3 will be A3. Yes or no? And 4 is a number here. F4 will be A4. F4 will be A4. Now, very clearly, F5 will be less than F4. A5 will be less than A4. A6 will be less than A5. After that, the ANs are decreasing. Right? A3 will be bigger than A2. Will be bigger than A1. Very clearly. So then there is a contest for the law. I have to compare A1, A2, A3, AN, right? So the contest now boils down to just two numbers, A3 and A4. So either A3 will be the greatest of all the ANs or A4 will be the greatest of all the ANs. Yes or no? So I just need to figure out which of the two is larger, A3 or A4, right? So let me just check what is A3. A3 is 3 by 19. A4 is 4 by 26, which is 2 by 13. This obviously is greater than 2 by 13. Why? Because 39 is bigger than 38. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> because 39 is bigger than 38. Very simple, right? So this is true. So A3 bigger than A4. Finish? We have a function phi x given as f x plus f of 1 minus x. In minus 1 to 1. And it is also given that f double dashed x is less than 0. Hmm. We want to show that phi x strictly increases. We want to show that phi x increases in the interval 0 to half. Hmm. We want to show that phi x increases in the interval 0 to half. This is what we want to show. Clear? Phi dash x. Let me do a phi dash x. Phi dash x is like an f dash x minus f dash 1 minus x. Very clearly, at x equal to half, it becomes 0. By inspection, at x equal to half, this will become 0. Yes or no? Because this is f dash half, this, will f dash, this is f dash 1 minus half, which is also half. Right? So, phi dashed half is very clearly 0. Put x equal to half, phi dashed half is very clearly 0. Right? Now I need to check whether this half is a local maximum or a local minimum. Right? If x equal to half is a local ma maximum, then before half it must have been increasing. Yes or no? So phi double dashed x. Phi double dashed x is like a f double dashed x plus f double dashed 1 minus x. f double dashed is greater than 0. f double dashed on any number in the domain will be greater than 0. Yes or no? So this is greater than 0. This is greater than 0. Oh, less than 0 is given. Sorry. f double dashed is less than 0. So this is less than 0. This is less than 0. So this sum will be less than 0. That means the second derivative at half will be less than 0. The first derivative is equal to 0. Half must therefore be a local maximum. x equal to half must therefore be a local maximum. If x equal to half is a local maximum, then very clearly you would expect the function to be at x equal to half, the function to go like this. 
at x equal to 0. It assumes some value at x equal to half. It assumes a local maximum and then it decreases. So the function strictly increases in the interval. Phi x strictly increases in the interval 0 to half because half is a local maximum of the function. Yes or no? Right? Hmm? Let's look at the next problem, 19. Huh? No, 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 no. That's actually, it should be 0 to 1 only because, <coughs> you know, this also should lie in the interval 0 to 1. Or, in fact, it's, it's the, the domain is given so that, you know, 1 minus x also belongs to the same, same interval. That is all. That, there is no other objective. We want to show, or rather, if this is an equation, summation a i squared divided by x minus b i i equal to 1 to n this equal to c where c is a constant and say b1 less than b2 less than b n etc we want to find the number of real roots of this equation. We want to find the number of real roots of this equation given this. Hey, do you realize that I could construct a function y equal to fx, which is summation a i squared by x minus b i, i equal to 1 to n minus c. Very clearly, this function is discontinuous, bless you, at all b i, b 1, b 2, b 3, this is undefined. And numerically, it will be very large. At any x equal to b i, it is numerically very large. Do you see that? See, what I mean is, limit fx, x tends to bi from the less than bi side say, when x is less than bi, this is a finite number, when x is less than bi, this will be negative and this will be very large, so this will be minus infinity, yes or no, fx will tend to minus infinity when x tends to bi from the less than bi side, this will be minus infinity, right, similarly, limit fx, x tends to b i from the greater than b i side, this will tend to plus infinity, this is a finite number anyways, right, so it will not alter plus infinity or minus infinity, so this will tend to plus infinity, right, so to the left of b i it tends to minus infinity, to the right of b i it tends to plus infinity, that means you know if this was a line x equal to b i, if this was a line x equal to b i, then to the left of bi, it will tend to minus infinity. To the right of bi, it will tend to plus infinity. So around x equal to bi, this will be the looks of fx. This will be the looks of fx. And at x equal to bi, it is very clearly discontinuous. That means at x equal to b1, b2, b3, the function is discontinuous. Clear? Now, <coughs> not only that, Between consecutive bi, bi, say b1 and b2, how does it behave? Let me see how the function would behave between consecutive bi's. Say this is some b1 and say this is some b2. All right. As x tends to b1 from the greater than b1 side, it tends to plus infinity. As x tends to b1 from the less than b1 side, it tends to minus infinity. As x tends to b2 from the less than b2 side, it tends to minus infinity. As x tends to b2 from less than b2 side, it tends to plus infinity. This is partially cooked, right? But I want to know exactly, okay, I know that between b1 and b2, it starts from heaven and goes downwards. 
Yes or no? But whether in the process of going from heaven to hell, whether it, how many times it's going to cross the x-axis, I want to know. This is the x-axis. This is the x-axis. I want to be able to figure out. Therefore, the monotonicity or local maxima, local minima, the trend of this function between B1 and B2, say. Right? What I do is, I differentiate this with respect to x. dy dx is minus summation ai squared by x minus bi whole squared. Yes or no? i equal to 1 to n? That's dy dx. And do you realize that this is negative for all x? It's negative for all x? Between b1 and b2, say, it's going to be negative. That means between b1 and b2, it must be a decreasing function of x. It must be monotonically decreasing, yes or no? Right? Therefore, if it monotonically decreases from b1 to b2, you would expect it to be like this, between b1 and b2. Similarly, between b2 and b3, similarly between b3 and b4, that means between any two consecutive b's, it will have a root alpha, yes or no? What do you say? Right? Now, let me formally trace the graph. Between any two consecutive bi's, it's monotonically decreasing. Why? Because dy dx is negative. Right? Now, Say this is B1, this is B2, this is B3, <coughs> going this way, this is Bn minus 1. And this is x equal to bn. This is x equal to bn. Right? You would expect between b1 and b2, the graph to be like this. Between b2 and b3, the graph to be like this. Between b3 and b4, the graph to be like this. Between bn minus 1 and bn, the graph to be like this. Yes or no? So, between every two consecutive bi's, there is a root alpha. So, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha n minus 1. Yes or no? Yes or no? Between any two consecutive bi's, there is one real root alpha 1, right? Because of the function being monotonically decreasing. So, how many ro real roots are there? n minus 1 real roots. Now, the point is I am not done. I am not done. I need to know what happens before B1. I need to know what happens after Bn, right? Those are also prospective domains to examine before B1 and after Bn, right? So one thing for sure, as far as B1 to Bn is concerned, it has n minus 1 real roots, right? Let's, let's investigate before B1 and after B1. Clear? <coughs> Now, do you also see that as x tends to infinity, all these n terms will tend to 0, y will tend to minus c. Yes or no, y will tend to minus c. Hmm? As x tends to minus infinity, 
then also y will tend to minus c right suppose c is positive then minus c will be a negative number then minus c will be a negative number right hmm? let me assume that c is positive then look this is b1 b2 bn minus 1 bn b1 b2 bn etc right and between b1 b2 there is going to be a root like you can see between b2 b3 there is going to be a root like this <coughs> between bn minus 1 and bn there is going to be a root like this right yes or no now y equal to minus c is this line this is the line y equal to minus c this is the line y equal to minus c as x tends to minus infinity this tends to 0 uh, y tends to minus c as x tends to minus infinity y tends to 0 and it's decreasing everywhere and it's decreasing everywhere and <coughs> To the as x tends to b1 from the less than b1 side, it will tend to minus infinity. Yes or no? As x tends to minus infinity, y tends to minus c. As x tends to b1 from the less than b1 side, it tends to minus infinity. Yes or no? As x tends to minus infinity, y tends to minus c. A fx tends to minus c. As x tends to b1 from the less than b1 side, it tends to minus infinity. Okay. As x tends to bn, as x tends to bn from the greater than bn side, it will tend to plus infinity. Yes, ulta ho jayega. If c is yes, yes. Yes or no? So 20A, we want to find the range of fx root x minus 3 plus 2 root 5 minus x. We want to find the range of this function. Root x minus 3 plus 2 root 5 minus x. So, is there a domain of this function? Yes. What is the domain? 3 to, 3 to 5. Right? So, you would restrict investigation of this function for x belonging to 3 to 5. Right? So, the domain of this function is Three to five, right? Because x minus three must be positive, five minus x must be positive. So x must be greater than or equal to three, less than or equal to five. Now, let me examine the monotonicity, etc., of this function, right? That way, I'll be able to know well intervals in which it is increasing, decreasing, maximum, minimum, etc., of that function, right? Now. If I differentiate this, f dash x <coughs> right? <coughs> That's f dash x, hmm? which is like root. 5 minus x minus 2 root x minus 3 divided by 2 root x minus 3 into 5 minus x, right? 
denominator is always positive, right? Let me find out the interval in which fx is increasing. That means f dash x greater than 0, right? f dash x greater than 0, that will give me the interval in which fx is increasing. This would happen if root 5 minus x is greater than 2 root x minus 3 f dash x will be greater than 0 for values of x commensurate with this condition, right? That means 5 minus x greater than 4 into x minus 3. That means 5x 17x less than 17 by 5, right? That means when x is less than 17 by 5, fx is increasing right so x less than 17 by 5 fx increases that means from 3 to 17 by 5 fx is increasing Similarly, exactly the same way f dash x will be less than 0 if all of this changes x greater than 17 by 5 x greater than 17 by 5, f dash x will be less than 0, f will be decreasing. So, for x greater than 17 by 5, f is decreasing, right? At x equal to 17 by 5, f dash will be 0 because this will become equal to this. That means, x equal to 17 by 5, to the left of 17 by 5, f dash is positive, to the right of 17 by 5, f dash is negative. At x equal to 17 by 5, f dash is 0. So, x equal to 17 by 5 must be a local maximum. Not only a local maximum, global maximum. That being the only stationary point in the meet of this interval, right? So, x equal to 17 by 5 will give me the maximum value of the function, yes or no? Right? So, essentially then, <coughs> at x equal to 17 by 5, the function has a maximum value f of 17 by 5, right? Then the domain is 3 to 5, this is 3, this is f3 and this is f5, yes or no? This is how the function behaves to the left of 17 by 5, it is increasing. To the right of 17 by 5, it is decreasing. The greatest value is f of 17 by 5. Now, the smallest value of the function will be smaller of f3 and f5. Yes or no? So, what is f3? f3 is 2 root 2. What is f5? Root 2. So, the smallest value of the function is f5. The largest value of the function is f17 by 5. So, the range of the function would be, what is f17 by 5? Have you computed this? Root 10. Okay. It is root 10. Okay. So, the range of the function is going to be root 10 to or rather root 2 to root 10. This is the smallest value root 2 to root 10. That is the range of the function. Clear? No issues with this? Okay, let us look at, have I asked you to solve 20B also? Okay, let us, can I wipe this off? Hmm? I, I, I was assuming that you would be able to solve this independently as well. Were you able to solve it independently? 20 Bombay. Again, fx is x power 4 minus x squared minus 2x plus 8 divided by x power 4 minus x squared minus 2x plus 4. We want to be able to find the range of this function. Clear? We want to be able to find the range of this function. 
Now what I could do is I could write fx as I could write this as plus 4 plus 4 right yes or no then I can divide this by this 1 plus 4 by this right yes or no this whole square plus 2 plus 2 x square square 1 plus 1 2 4 minus 2 x square minus x square right yes or no is it not right <coughs> now let me call this some gx the denominator right that's that's a thing to examine hmm? gx very clearly for all real x is always greater than or equal to 2 yes or no when gx is minimum fx will be maximum yes or no what is the minimum value of gx 2 and that happens at x equal to 1 right so when gx is gx min when gx is gx min which is equal to 2 fx will be fx max which would be this becomes 2 so 3 yes or no so the maximum value of fx is 3 the greatest value of fx is 3 now gx max infinity because as x becomes larger and larger this expression will become larger and larger so gx max is infinity yes or no gx max is as large as you can imagine as x becomes larger and larger gx becomes larger and larger yes or no so when gx is infinity fx will become fx min yes or no so when gx tends to infinity this would mean that fx would tend to fx min as x is made larger and larger fx will come closer and closer to 1 because this will tend to 0 fx will come closer and closer to 1 so this will come closer and closer to 1 so the minimum value of fx is 1 the largest value of fx is 3 range of fx is 1 2 3 right so the range of fx is 1 2 3 that is the range where <coughs> actually it never assumes a value equal to 1 because see it never assumes infinity so you do not want to include 1 but it does assume a value equal to 3 at x equal to 1 it will actually assume a value 3 so you want to include 3 but not include 1 it will come closer and closer to 1 but will never become equal to 1 right so this is the range 1 to 3 where 1 is included but 3 is uh, 1 is excluded but 3 is included in the description that's the range of fx clear all right let's look at the next. so 21 <laughs> we want to find the domain of f inverse x we want to find the domain of f inverse x if fx is 1 by x cubed if fx is 1 by x cubed and x goes from 
the domain of fx is minus 3 to 0 obviously it's not defined at x equal to 0 union 0 to 5 so that means 3 minus 3 to 5 excluding minus 3 5 and 0 right <coughs> Let me draw the graph of fx. Hmm? Let's draw the graph of fx. So, f dash x, do you realize, is minus 3 by x power 4. Minus 3 by x power 4. So, always negative for all x. Right? That means, in the entire domain of f, f is decreasing. f is a decreasing function of x. Right? Also, as x tends to plus infinity, fx tends to plus infinity, plus fx tends to 0, right? And is positive. f is positive and tends to 0 from the greater than 0 side, isn't it? Hmm? As x tends to minus infinity, fx tends to 0. fx tends to 0, yes or no? And from the negative 0, from the less than 0 side, because x cube would be negative, right? So, x would tend to 0 from the less than 0 side. Hmm? And the function is decreasing throughout. The function is decreasing throughout. And as x tends to 0 from the greater than 0 side, as x tends to 0 from the greater than 0 side, fx tends to plus infinity, and as x tends to 0 from the less than 0 side, x cube would be negative, fx would tend to minus infinity. Yes or no? Do you all register this data? Oh, we will just have to put it all together in the xy plane. Okay. Decreasing everywhere. As x tends to 0 from the greater than 0 side, fx tends to plus infinity. And it is monotonically decreasing. And as x tends to infinity, fx tends to 0 from the greater than 0 side. So this right? As x tends to 0 from the less than 0 side, fx tends to minus infinity. Means like this, right? And as x tends to minus infinity, fx tends to 0 from the less than 0 side. Right? But the entire thing is not the graph of the function. Why? Because the domain of f is given to be minus 3 to 0 and 0 to 5. 0 is excluded. So this is minus 3. This is 5. Right? This is the graph of fx in this domain with x equal to 0 being excluded from the description. Yes or no? Which means now the range of fx, the range of fx, do you realize this would be minus 1 by 27, 1 by x cubed and this would be 1 by 125. Very clearly, range get interchanged, right? So, the range of the domain of f inverse x would be the range of fx, right? The domain of f inverse x would be the range of fx. The range of fx is minus 1 by 27 to 1 by 125, yes or no? So, the range of this is like minus 1 by 27 to 1 by 125. That's the range of f. And this therefore will be the domain of f inverse x. Clear? We want to find the number of relations to this equation. Log 3 to the base x. I want to be able to find the number of real solutions to this. That means... Realistically, 
I'm going to draw the graph of y equal to log 3 to the base x. I'm going to draw the straight line y equal to 2x minus 3 and the number of points of intersection will give me the number of real solutions. Yes or no? Yes, right? Hmm? This is peanuts y equal to 2x minus 3 straight line with slope 2 y intercept minus 3. Let me draw the graph of this log 3 to the base x. Right? Hmm? First of all, uh, log x to the base 3, of course, this anyways, this anyways will be defined for x greater than 0. That's the domain, isn't it? That's the domain. This, right? So, but in any case, let me, let me look at log x to the base 3 for x greater than 0. Which is like log x by log 3 to maybe base e, right? It will be the same as the graph of log x. At x equal to 1, it will become 0. As x tends to 0 from the greater than 0 side, it will be minus infinity. As x tends to infinity, it will be plus infinity. This is the graph of log x to the base 3. This is the graph of log x to the base 3, right? Yes or no? Hmm? I have to draw the graph of the reciprocal of this. I have to draw the graph of the reciprocal of this. That means I have to draw log 3 by log x. Log 3 by log x. Right? <coughs> now, As x tends to 0 from the greater than 0 side, this will tend to minus, minus infinity. As x tends to 0 from the greater than 0 side, this will tend to minus infinity. Right? Yes or no? Log x would tend to. So then, and as x tends to infinity, this will tend to this will tend to, as x tends to infinity, this will tend to infinity. So this will be 0, yes or no? Right? Hmm? At x equal to 1, it will be undefined. See, it has a point of, except unlike this, which is defined at x equal to 1, this will be undefined at x equal to 1. So x equal to 1 is not included in the domain of this. However, it was included in the domain of this. But in log 3 by log x, which is this, x equal to 1 is not included in the description, right? So, x equal to 1 is like this. This is the line x equal to 1 and I am attempting to draw the graph of log 3 by log x, right? Log 3 by log x. This is the line x equal to 1. As x tends to 1 from the less than 1 side, Hmm. This will be negative. When x is slightly less than 1, this will be negative. But will tend to 0. So this, this tends to 0 from the less than 0 side. So y tends to minus infinity. As x tends to 1 from the less than 1 side, y will tend to minus infinity. Yes or no? Hmm. As x tends to 1 from the greater than 1 side, y would tend to, this will tend to 0 from the greater than 0 side, this will tend to plus infinity. Yes or no? Hmm? Now what would I do? How do I trace the graph completely? As x increases, as x becomes larger and larger, y tends to 0. So this part of the graph is obvious. This part of the graph is obvious. Right? Yes or no? Hmm? What about this part? Yeah, to the left of 0, it will not exist. But between 0 and 1, as x tends to 0, 
what will happen to this log x log x will tend to minus infinity this will tend to zero this will tend to zero yes or no zero is a kink zero is a kink what do you say hmm? clear na <coughs> now this is the graph of y equal to log 3 to the base a x right this is the graph of y equal to log 3 to the base x y equal to 2x minus 3 would be this this is y equal to 2x minus 3 at x equal to 3 by 2 y becomes 0 this is 0 comma minus 3 y intercept slope 2 how many points of intersection Yes, sorry, two points of intersection. One root alpha, the other root beta, two roots. Yes or no? So the number of real solutions to this equation would be two, alpha and beta. You know, the way these roots are actually obtained, you know, down the line you learn as engineers, there are numerical techniques. Sometimes, you know, uh, you can't create an explicit equation and solve the roots like you've learned most real life problems will give you equations that are not solved by methods that you have learnt in books they are solved numerically they actually are solved by you know writing a program that will draw the graph and you know they will do this or there are numerical techniques you know uh, for solving equations that are uh, complicated in which you know you can't explicitly obtain the value of x by factorizing or Sridharacharya or so on and so forth. Uh, maybe maybe if possible towards the end of our session I'll teach you what's called Newton Raphson method, Ranga Kutta method. That's another method of obtaining roots numerically. R U N G A K U T T A. I mean you could pronounce it either way you like but for the sake of the class I call it kutta instead of Ranga <laughs> kutta method then there is Newton Raphson method these are two very popular techniques and then there are more sophisticated techniques there is an error produced we start with a basic solution and we converge to the so solution uh, iteratively uh, there is a code that is written but then you will have to give brains to the code and numerically the problem could be solved but graphically you know even your ordinary calculators will be able to draw two graphs and will be able to show you these points of intersection bless you yes or no now um, one thing at this stage you should feel very comfortable drawing graphs you know I have given you a very brief stint a very informal approach to drawing graphs I have never given you so far a very formal class on graphs etc but then you know the elements that are required to draw the graphs those elements I have communicated at various times in various forms right even if you keep those elements I will still have to teach you some more tools some sophisticated tools in terms of uh, curve tracing uh, asymptotes etc which is like refining curves looking at uh, symmetry of curves etc some of those things but I do have a formal class on graphs and curve tracing which will not be conducted right now before I teach you area calculations in which you know uh, a very extensive knowledge of curve tracing would be required before I, I embark on mission uh, area calculations I am going to give you a formal session on graphs as well but then the basic that is required is already there with you you will not feel very uncomfortable with these ideas these are very basic things straight out of the basic calculus that you have learned basic investigation of functions etc